we have a lot of uh, concepts uh, and uh, certainly a lot of uh, questions. So, yeah. Uh, Thank you very much. I'm going to ask a very simple question. I'm a, I was a finance educated person, actually, but I want to break it down in a very simple uh, manner as a f former um, decision maker person. Uh, my question is, what do you mean by economic efficiency? The word came often time. But for me, economic e efficiency is to be able to be on the market and finance my projects. Um, what I understood is money is not going to flow from what I've understood. So my question is, do you think um, as a person who I intend, but I used to, um, you know, deliver for the people who elected me um, do I have more chance to going to China and raise money than coming to Europe to do so, um, considering the fact that um, I might be in, the co in a continent that, it w that is wealthy, that can sort of, you can borrow against um, the wealth that is there, providing that you manage it well and you fight corruption and what have you. Um, so how do you see the China-Europe um, uh, relationship or even balance in, to that regard, because that's the question that is posed to us in Africa. And what do you think or how do you see some alternative funding mechanism for infrastructure financing? Um, as I said, um, for countries who do have wealth. Um, so that that's really my question as a as a client, <laughs> you know, that's a very good, how you look very at good it. question indeed. And uh, perhaps Masoud could uh, start to respond. Uh. Well, I would just say uh, one uh, thing in response oh, now, sorry, sorry. which is that uh, I think at the moment it's actually quite hard to get money out of China. If you look at the numbers. Uh, for Chinese lending, particularly to Africa. They've gone down quite dramatically. I don't have the numbers in my head, but it's like a very dramatic decline in the financing from... Uh, and the second thing I would say is that some of the emerging markets are still able to access it, but it depends on how robust their own finances are. So anybody who has relatively high debt or uh, has high repayments in the next year is having difficulty accessing the markets, but the others are able to do it. Maybe Jean-Claude will have more market information on this, but. Jean-Claude, do you want to say a word? No. Uh, let me only mention myself that uh, it's not China vis-a-vis -vis Europe, uh, as far as I understand. It's China on the one hand, vis-a-vis -vis all other, I would say, continent, including the US, Europe, and uh, uh, there are two, two aspects uh, in what we have observed. One is that uh, China has a real problem and creates a real problem when they refuse to take into account that they over-indebted some uh, countries and uh, they don't participate in the system which permits to alleviate the debt. So it's a real issue and uh, they are uh, having some problems with the Silk Road, Belt and Road. Uh, that, that are associated with this. And uh, <clears throat> of course, you still have the African Development Bank, the World Bank, I mean, the, the system, the multilateral system still there. And of course, what Mazoud was saying in permitting this system to take more risk, capture more, have a, a leverage with the private uh, sector and have more money for Senegal and for the other African countries, is something that we would uh, strongly uh, recommend. But, uh, yeah, please, just, just, La last word, and then yes, I, just, I follow the question. Because <laughs> we, with, with, some, with some people around the table, I, I, I have skin in the game. Uh, I'm trying to invest in, in this country, and, and uh, th your question is absolutely legitimate. One of the issues we are facing, and again, we are, we are discussing with Jean-Michel, and I'm sure you will add something to this over lunch, 
Uh, as, as Masoud said, one of the big issues we are facing is that the, the public system is not up to the expectations, full stop. Uh, and that's, that's a massive issue. You mentioned risk aversion. I think this is the crux of the problem. Uh, again, I want to enter into horror stories, but I've, I've been personally involved in three or four reports on blended finance. I'm tired of doing reports on blended finance. I mean, we know everything which is working. We know all the instruments that should be put at, at, at risk. We should just do it, and it's not happening. Again, there are many reasons for that. So I fully support your reason. I fully support the idea that we need to shake the tree and do. There are instruments. There are resources. I mean, we, we don't need to invent the wheel. I mean, that is not the, the, the problem. The problem is just to find a way to get there. So the, the question for all of us is uh, who blocks? Uh, and, but, but we will respond afterwards because I have okay. five que questions. So, so since you declined the request of yeah. the Prime Minister, I'm going to go back by the, by the window and, and maybe ask the same question under a different angle. I'm going to start with a very obvious statement, but it's good to make it. If you have one euro or one dollar to invest, it's much better to invest it in uh, India to fight climate change than it is in uh, Denmark, right? That being said, and going back to what Masoud and Pierre said, you know, clearly there is a risk context, which is that, yeah, there is a, a increasing uh, perception that debt is, is, is going to be risky. And, and so a suggestion maybe for regulators in the context of Basel III and SICA and the equivalent in Europe would be to sort of ring fence this kind of investment, separate from the uh, usual EM debt and recognize the fact that it's such a benefit globally uh, that you could reduce the risk of that investment almost to zero uh, from a SICA perspective, right? Uh, of course, under the proper monitoring. Uh, so that that uh, return uh, is, is understood and, and the risk is seen as acceptable by the rest of the, of the world. Right? Okay, we take uh, this question and you reflect on the response. I'm sorry, I yeah. go through the, the yeah, successive I, question now. Jean-Claude, you, you will the first to, to respond. Uh, I have a question following the one uh, Prime Minister raised regarding the investments in infrastructure. Actually, my question is for Masoud. Masoud, you mentioned uh, multi uh, development bank, MDB, are required to mobilize the private business, make investment infrastructure. But seems to me by nature, the private business is more risk aversion relative to MDB. So in another way, private business is not, is not good identity to make investment infrastructure. So it seems to me it's kind of a contradiction. So I want to listen to your comment on that. Thank you for this very good question, please. Okay. You as well the floor. Yeah, thank you. So, so one, one issue that, uh, uh, that worries me is that uh, the levels of debt around the world are high, higher than uh, uh, for the last 200 years. And the Economist is, is running a story uh, on this uh, right now, I think uh, very valid. And the big question behind that is uh, how do we think that uh, interest rates and growth rates will compare to each other over the next decades or so? And so we had this discussion R versus G, you know, uh, and, and the, you know, uh, until two years or so, people were, I think, converging on the view that uh, our star, the equilibrium interest rate, is declining, falling below the growth rates that we can sustain, and so the high debt levels are not an issue. But I think the three Cs that John mentions, all of them drive up interest rates, um, drive down growth rates. So uh, how do we deal with these enormous debt levels in the world where they are maybe higher than the cheese or for longer time periods. So that's, uh, and, and what, what do we do with that crisis, uh, you know, in emerging markets first maybe, and then later also in the more mature ones? Yeah, well, I would say the, the central bank are not doing what they did in the first oil shock and second oil shock, namely practicing benign neglect vis-a-vis -vis inflation, and then being obliged to catch up dramatically 
with interest rates at the level of 20% in, at the beginning of the 80s and not at five or four, as is the case uh, in the US and Europe. So fortunately, part of the explanation that we do not have this dramatic crisis that we had with the Latin America crisis of, the, uh, of this period uh, is perhaps that uh, we have wiser central banks, but I stop there. Uh, Jean-Michel? Oh, I'm <coughs> sorry. It was me, you, you too no. have the floor, oh, sorry. please. Uh, as in the order that you would, uh, you would prefer. <clears throat> Yes, thank you very much. Uh, I would like to answer Prime Minister uh, Touré and make a comment on trade. Uh, actually, it's the second year or the third year in a row, I think, that uh, negative in, uh, Africa ex is experiencing negative net flows to China, which is an unprecedented event uh, since for the past 20 years. Okay? And it's going to last. It's going to last because uh, China is very slow at restructuring its debt and it's downsizing dramatically the roads and belts initiative for internal domestic uh, fiscal reasons and also the overall uh, debt situation and interest rate situation. So it's uh, highly unlikely that in the coming five years uh, there will be um, as open access to Chinese money as it has been in the past, let's say, 20, 20 years. And of course, it's very unfortunate because this is taking place at a moment when, because of everything that has been said here about interest rates, etc., markets are shifting. Basically, it has come, we have come to a moment where this now, it's nearly impossible to raise equity for investments in uh, emerging markets and especially for Africa. And debt flows have shifted back towards OECD countries in a nutshell. Uh, so uh, we are back to a situation where public flows are really the key concern. And you can, as Masoud already mentioned it, uh, we have to, to really focus on debt restructuring, debt consolidation. And here China is the leader, nothing will be done without their leadership and their acceptance of terms, given what uh, Bertrand said uh, about their preeminence in uh, debt stocks. And second, of course, public institutions, bilateral or multilateral, are at the forefront of providing uh, additional uh, money uh, for liquidity concerns or for investments. Yet. And I will stop there on that because we could, we could spend a lot of time on this issue. There's still room open for specific invest, private investments in infrastructure. Because if you go on a case-by-case -case basis and if you're able to provide exciting investments with uh, high returns, uh, because of the overall liquidity situation, uh, you could attract, one could attract specific investors in specific PPPs. But that, which require a lot of, uh, which in, 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 uh, of uh, preparation and framework from governments to make those PPPs credible. But this window is still, in my mind, uh, open uh, on the private side. Thank a you. Very no. and, and a very short comment on trade. Mm. Uh, I'm participating, I'm uh, involved in uh, several uh, very capital intensive multinationals. Uh, what is very striking uh, in, for those corporations and in their strategies is that uh, beyond everything that uh, Mr. Lipsky mentioned and which are completely, fully correct, uh, there is now a very different um, beacon in terms of choosing uh, locations of productions. This used to be mainly labor costs, which is, has driven uh, the manufacturing sector uh, and especially the heavy manufacturing sector in, in Asia. But now the cost of energy and access to a competitive clean energy uh, has become the new beacon because labor costs are not playing the same role as they were before for technological reasons. Robotization is lowering in relative terms the role of labor costs. And that, you know, having clean energy is really what matters for those heavy industries. So, 
And this is, by the way, one of the opportunities for emerging economies, including Africa. And the, the, the thinking about heavy industry has completely changed uh, and uh, has opened new opportunities for countries which have this type of access and building a competitive advantage which was not absolutely not there 20 mm -hmm. or even 10 years ago. Just Very on. interesting. Um, I'm sorry because we have the, the first batch of questions. So we stick to the five questions that we have and we see how to respond. And then you will be the first to uh, ask the next question. But Jean-Claude is the first to address the part of the questions that uh, he wanted to comment on. So I just wanted to come back, come back to the question of the former Prime Minister of Senegal in, in so far as Chinese financing. The problem is not the availability only, it's the quality. And when we look at the Chinese financing, we see, for instance, there has been a financing of a, of a highway in Montenegro. The cost of a road was absolutely outrageous. And of course, they offered to Montenegro a 30 years financing. But that's terrible for Montenegro. They don't know how to sort out this story. Not to mention copper mines uh, in RDC, of course, and other financing in Africa. So I would, I would very uh, modestly be a little blunt, but warn you on uh, Chinese financing. OK, thank you very much indeed. And the, the remark which was made on China uh, now exporting, I mean, importing money out of Africa, I must confess I didn't know that. Uh, uh, of course, it means that uh, they are repayments on the one hand and new money on the other hand, but the algebraic uh, computation would give a negative flow coming from Africa to, to China. I didn't know that. Uh, it has to be checked because it's, it's a little bit uh, surprising. But thank you very much. So now we have to respond to all the questions which were asked to the speakers. So uh, could you raise your hands? Uh, you, you, a lot of questions on trade. John, you respond? And of yeah. course you have uh, I, I was going to say a few words on the, the uh, debt issues. Mm. And uh, uh, first of all, that debt issues are high. But of course, the issue of how much is too much depends on how much does debt cost? And then in this context, it's, I think it's very, it, it's critical whether the central banks are successful in reducing inflation, because if so, it will reduce long-term interest rates. As I put it in the U.S. context, for the first time uh, in my memory, in my lifetime, individuals, households, have, have structured their own financial affairs with the assumption of sustained low inflation and low interest rates. And it, that's why I think it will be very in, interesting. I, I assume that there, in fact, is rather broad public support for getting inflation back down again and in interest rates. If that's the case, then the, the challenge with regard to debt levels be, will, be, uh, will be muted relative to what they, what they would be otherwise. And with regard to sovereign debt, uh, the, uh, of course, pre, uh, before the global financial crisis, the Paris Club pr provided a working, uh, a working process for, re for restructuring uh, sovereign debt. And that obviously, if there is a working system, a smoothly working system, that encourages, uh, that makes it easier for countries to borrow. Uh, the system is broken right now for reasons that we all understand. Uh, and the G20 established something called the Common Framework for, for Debt Treatments that has not been anywhere near as successful as, as anticipated. What is happening now, it's uh, low profile. The, under the, the IMF and World Bank have jointly established something called the Global Sovereign Debt Roundtable that has brought together in a confidential way, uh, re, not completely confidential, there's a public report of, the, of their discussions, both lenders, borrowers, both private and public. And hopefully there's enough of pressure on all sides to make some uh, arrangements that will at least uh, make this uh, process much more, uh, much easier. Just two, one other thing. When we talk about why hasn't more money gone into things like climate change, public goods, 
uh, the, we're working on this at the Bretton Woods Committee, and think of it in terms of two gaps, a public sector gap and a private sector gap. What is specifically holding back uh, debt flows? For the private sector, there's a lack of price discovery mechanisms for things like lending for uh, uh, climate-related uh, projects. There's a lack at present of adequate instruments by which you could express that uh, investment, and a lack of enforcement mechanisms, reliable enforcement mechanisms that mean if you, in, if a private, if you invest in a project, how do you know it's really going to produce the results that uh, were expected? There was a session on this earlier today that, mm -hmm. was, uh, that was very interesting, I thought. For the public sector, what are the problems? There's a lack of any governance, clear governance structure and financing. It's each institution doing its own thing. There's lack of governance on implementation in for these kinds of projects. There's, there's no standardization and similarly, there's no independent ex post assessment, sim similarly for the private sector, that you know that what you, uh, you can count on what you did, what you lent actually had the, uh, uh, had the effect that was claimed. And it seems to us that until those specific gaps are filled, we're not going to have a, any substantial uh, increase in flows. These are preconditions for, uh, for success. There, you mentioned the absence of coordination between the bilateral donors, is that right? Yeah, yeah, yeah because the multilateral institutions are, are functioning more or less. Yeah. Thank you very much indeed. Mazoud is the floor. I just want to say one thing about uh, the uh, private investment that you, you asked, uh, and Jean-Michel gave part of the answer uh, to that. I would just say two th you know, one thing that we have to be clear, for, uh, clear about is to be more <coughs> realistic about where we expect private flows to go. So we're more likely to get private flows into emerging markets and better middle-income countries than we are in fragile states. So it, to me, it makes less sense to put a lot of official money grants to try and subsidize private sector to attract them to fragile states, because you use a lot of grants to get limited amount of private money. Whereas if you do in middle income countries, you can actually get more. So I think one is just to be a bit more open, clear eyed about that. And the other thing is the instruments that they use. So for example, you know, you just look at the World Bank, if they use guarantees, they mobilize four times as much private money with guarantees than they do with the loan. But the internal incentives for doing guarantees is that it doesn't help the staff to do a guarantee. So they like to do loans rather than guarantees. Now here's something you can change that would have an impact. So I think that's just one on private sector. The second thing I wanted to respond to was on debt, just to pick up one point. One is that there are a lot of countries that the IMF has been saying for four years are at high risk of debt distress. But there are very few countries that actually default. If you look at the number of countries that have defaulted, and that's not because they're not under pressure, it's because the cost of defaulting in the system we have to fix defaults today is really high for a finance minister. So we did some work looking at what happens to their spending? And what happens is that they keep paying their debt service, which is rising, sometimes 50%, 70% of their revenues, but they cut back on education, they cut back on health, and they cut back on future investment. So in effect, they're defaulting on the next generation rather than to their external creditors because the cost of doing that is very high. And, and linked to that, I would just say, they're, the system will not improve for a year or 18 months. Despite the efforts of this sovereign debt roundtable, it's slow, it's messy, it be small incremental improvement. I personally don't think that 18 months from now we'll have a radically better system. And therefore the question really to me is, in this situation, how do you help the countries that are under the greatest financial liquidity pressures today, rather than hoping that somehow the system is going to get fixed and they're going to have some grand design. You know, the World Bank is very keen, actually, on talking about, let's have another HIPEC. And uh, 
you know, first of all, HIPIC doesn't make sense for the current structure of creditors. And secondly, there's no political basis on which the Chinese and the Paris Club creditors will come together in a HIPIC-like format now. And therefore, we should be focusing our energies on what helps the countries the most, rather than on some grand design which is unlikely to come about with the politics being what they are. So, Thank you very much indeed, Masoud. As a former president of Paris Club, I will say a word, but after we have heard all the response, all the responses. So uh, do we have other speakers that would, would? Yeah, please, please, of course, Bertrand. Thank you, Jean-Claude. Uh, I wanted to react to Jan's uh, proposition. I, I think what strikes me today is that on the one hand, we continue to say that there is an emergency. and. Uh, but we don't act as if it was a real emergency. We talk about this being urgent. We talk about we need to change things. And the reality is that it's more of the same. So instead of putting 1 billion, you put 2 billion. And the 2 billion don't move anyway. Uh, and, and so I think we, I mean, we've addressed all the issues, all the gaps, etc. And again, no need to come back on that. But I think to face this sense of emergency, we should really work on two things, uh, learning to be a little bit more generous. Uh, and I think uh, generosity is not necessarily a word that match word with, uh, well with finance, but I think, uh, I, I would say, we, we need, I mean, this, this, I think this was the words of President Macron in Paris. What he means with that, not sure, but he said we need a shock of concessional finance. We need real grant money. I mean, we don't have, I mean, we are discussing, I mean, you, you can ask the World Bank to lend more, but this will add to the debt thing. So it, it's a vicious circle. So I think we need to be generous in a way or another. We have been capable in a number of countries to subsidize gasoline during the rise of prices, I mean, 50 billion in France. I mean, we could have used this money in a different manner. I mean, it's a, of course, it raised political questions, et cetera. So generosity and, and, and our genuine interest is to move in that direction. I think this is, this is important. And the second thing, coming back to Jan's point, I think we have to be a little bit more innovative in the way we apprehend things. I think we will die of doing more of the same forever. In the, in the regulatory framework itself, of course, yeah. yeah. Of course. No, no, but there are a number of issues coming back to Senegal. I mean, depending on whether you're an OECD country or non-OECD country, with the same rating, the cost of capital for investment is double. With the same uh, rating. And, and are, I mean, the long list of things is like this. And, and we know that. And we know it's urgent. We explain, I mean, I don't want to enter into the discussion on how to finance uh, gas in Senegal. I mean, this is a very interesting topic. But you, you have all these issues everywhere, and we circle around. And, and so I, I, I strongly support this type of approach. We need to, I'm not sure this is the right one, but at least to, to address this, we have a global issue which needs to be addressed locally, and we need to find the instruments which connect the local and the global to go there. And we are incapable of doing that. OK, so if we want to be a little bit practical, could we say that, first of all, we need China on board, goes without saying because it's a, an anomaly which is very, very great. And we should exert maximum pressure on Chinese friends for them to, to join the international community in a domain where it is in their own interest, because it's not their interest to be uh, free in free lands in this domain, no? Yes, I, I agree with you. Of course, we need to have as many people on board as possible, including, obviously, China. But, but, but China, China is the first creditor, so yeah, 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 it, it, uh, it's come, aberrant. Come for the other should not do anything because uh, they would work for. Uh, no, I think it's a, it's a matter of understanding exactly how the the problem. I, I discussed with Chinese friends; they have a difficulty to understand exactly what is at stake because they have not their own procedure to reschedule, and they prefer to deliver new money and get uh, the, the payment, so, but, but yeah. anyway, so. Uh, let me just, because, yeah, uh, uh, and, uh, yeah. of course we need to have China, but it's not, it shouldn't be an excuse for the EU or the US not to do anything. I mean, we have said at the G7. Uh, uh, who it, says that they do nothing? I'm the EU. No, I mean, we, we do things, but we could do way more. I mean, we have said at the G7 in Germany last year in El Mao that the, the G7 will commit $600 billion uh, to emerging and developing economies. I remember I was with President Macron in Africa, and one of the guys, there were some people from the civil society saying, President Macron, this is great, where is the money? Yeah. It's a fair question. Of, it's course, a fair question. of course, but if, if you take the case of France, Fra Fra France is broke, so it's not a very good example. Uh, no, no fr frankly speaking, do we, we have magnificent promises, but uh, it's a little bit more complicated to, to, to get the money. 
out of the budget. Uh, but uh, yeah, please, sir. Okay. You know, I guess uh, many people mentioned the, the, the debt uh, China to developing countries. I guess um, some factor we should keep in mind. Yes, China is one of largest official um, uh, debt uh, countries. But if you look the whole uh, debt uh, situation, actually private credit occupy most debt owned by developing countries. Having said that, I'm not going to uh, defend uh, what Chinese government you know. From what I heard from some Chinese official, what they worry about is if uh, Chinese government uh, involve some debt restriction. They worry about the money they give out. <laughs> the debt country will pay back to private credit. That's something they a little bit of concern. So no, as, a, as someone say, we should, uh, like uh, John say, get together yeah. to have uh, some comprehensive uh, the, the it, it is the, the right concept. You're absolutely right. The right concept is that there is a balance of efforts made by all creditors on the one hand, and it should be emulated by the same balance of credit on the other hand. And the, the idea was always we understand that it's very difficult for, uh, for the private sector but then the private sector can compensate with new money. I mean, there, there, there was always a balance. If it is not balanced, you're absolutely right. There is no case. Nobody uh, will be uh, happy, and neither the private nor the public uh, in any of the countries concerned. So we have to re reconstruct something which would work. The, pri the, the public uh, sector, in my opinion, is up and running but one country is not participant. The private sector, that's another story. And the work that you're doing in the Bretton Woods uh, and, and uh, the, I would say, the uh, institution concerns that you mentioned is very, very important, of course, uh, John. Huh? What, what, I'll say oh. just one word. The, um, the, the idea of the sovereign debt work, uh, round table is exactly get everybody around the table. The situation is everybody's going to have to do something. I think the trigger is going to be the, the debtor countries, and as Masood had pointed out, who have been basically a, uh, uh, starving themselves in a way, uh, or on a, on a severe diet to avoid re trying to restructure because the system is so broken, I think they, they have to put pressure on the, on the uh, lending countries and saying, enough is enough you guys have got to get together. Hopefully that round table will be a context, a confidential context in which they can say we, we all have to participate. I, I hope it's faster than Masood's uh, timetable, but. Jean-Claude, very quickly, I, I, I am very skeptical that China will join uh, the Paris Club for a simple reason. They, they have their own two thirds more than 60% actually of country to country debt. And they have very strong convenience, I mean, very strong bilateral agreements. Why would they mutualize the risk? You because know? it was the case of all the other creditors. At the very beginning, there was no such agreement. But now it's and then late. progressively, all public creditors discovered that if they wanted to get out of the difficulties and help the country's concern, they had to discuss together to be sure that everybody would make the same efforts, whatever the covenant uh, and so forth. But we, 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 again, it's, it's easy to speak of uh, a government which is not there, very easy. But I, I had exactly the same problem in my time with some emerging economies that were creditor of, and, and we had arrangement, we could solve the problem. It is, it is solvable. Now, now an, another problem, another problem which is solvable, uh, Mazoud, is to change the culture inside the MDBs and the World Bank. But yes, yeah, be, 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 in principle. Because <laughs> if a, a, a significant part of the risk can be taken by the public institutions, then we are leveraging the private sector. Please, madam. Yes, the country you're talking about, I mean, I'm <laughs> part of one of them. So actually, I think sometimes it's a, it's a, 
it's a dialogue that we, and we don't understand ourselves. First of all, there is no ideology involved in the financing of our economy. Wherever the money can come from, we're looking for it. So it that it has to be very clear. And the Europeans should not see it as African being pro-Chinese. We could be pro whoever as long as the money comes. So, so that yeah. it has to be very clear. clear enough. Because it's, take, it's taking a political sometime turn into it. Um, what we are looking forward, and Masoud, thank you for saying that we are the best payers when it comes to our debt. We, we, we just pay to the last penny. So that needs to be said. It's not like gifts that you know, are just delivered. And we starve ourselves sometime to do so because we know the cost. If you don't do that, you don't, re you don't pay your civil servant, and you're out as a government because you have the streets that will take you out. So that we do pay. But what we are looking forward to is money sitting on the market, and we do have great plan of, of developing our industry, for instance. In Senegal, we, we don't even manufacture needles. We import them. Um, and that's where the support is expected on a win-win situation, because I, I do believe it's going to be business-to-business uh, -business development. So I do think that there is a money for that. Everybody can make money on it, so why it's not happening? So that's my, that's my very question. And then you go back to some type of ideology, because I'm like, is there a willingness collectively to support those countries to get out of their current situation? You ended up doubting it. Because they, I mean, I don't know, because the money is there. So if we can, if we can sit down and have really a, a reasonable discussion, then we can make it together. Because I you, do think Europe needs that. You were speaking I, I of, do, of I, public money or private money for, for the needles? Well, you will always have the public supporting the business to business contract. I mean, by creating the, 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 the right environment, uh, making sure that uh, justice, uh, you know, come along, uh, corruption is uh, contained, uh, you know, contained, uh, and, and things like that. So that's, that's why I, I think we don't understand each other most of the time, because every time I have this kind of discussion with bankers, um, it, it, they, they have hard time understanding where we are coming from. Um, and why I raise the, the China issue um, if you look into the period, the 15 years of collaboration, some countries with China, they have never been able to raise money to develop the minimum of their infrastructure. That's why when China came in, that you saw the boom. And that's the truth. That's what we have seen. That, that's the real truth. So in between, we had a 500 years relationship with Europe. It didn't happen. And then you have a 20 or 15 years with China, it does. So uh, see the, where the logic is. So that, that's, that, that's, that's really, I mean, I'm talking to you very bluntly. Yeah, because yeah, that's what we, how we discuss we it to, among ourselves. To have the, this extent so, yeah. of views, so, of so, course. So please can, look into it. I'm saying that because, China, because Senegal is going to be a gas country. We have one of the huge, we think, reserved of gas. Mm -hmm. So the, the, the question is going to be right there. Mm -hmm. So, but we, they will be necessary to have a, a change in the, in the thinking uh, coming from the banking sector um, in Europe, precisely. Otherwise, we will do business with whoever, yeah. because we need that, that but, business to happen. But Mrs. Minister, we were uh, yeah. not uh, saying that China was giving uh, too much money to the country's concern. We were, <laughs> on the contrary, uh, realizing perhaps that the flow is in the other direction, which is not necessarily the case for your own idea and your own investment. But clearly, the problem was to have all the countries of the world in order to try to solve the problems, the public credit. I'm, I'm only speaking of public credit. The private credit are in the hands of this uh, concept that you are trying to uh, crystallize. But we have specialist of ODA here, uh, and I would like very much to hear Mazoud and Jean-Michel, perhaps. How would you comment on uh, what said the Minister of Senegal? W would you say that uh, if we change the culture of the MDBs, then we will find the money, including by leveraging the private money for doing what uh, the Minister is asking for? Well, uh, no, I think that, that will certainly help. But I would say there's a bigger problem, which is, uh, 
If you look at our ODA, I think somebody made the point earlier that uh, we have 200 billion, roughly, give or take, of ODA, right? It's gone up in the last four years. But all the increase is accounted for by the extra money that we spend on refugees in our own countries here. So the largest recipient of Swedish order today is Sweden. The largest recipient of UK order is the UK. <laughs> so, and that doesn't help. Secondly, it's the money we're putting into Ukraine. And so if you look at order to Africa, it has actually gone down. So, it's, so I would say there's a general point. And secondly, I would also say now, we want to use the same order for doing climate finance in middle income countries. So we're saying we need to use this ODA to incentivize the middle income countries, Indonesia, to borrow for coal commissioning, decommissioning of coal. They need cheaper money, so let's use ODA. And they're going to IDA, which is the only window that is really focused on poor countries, low income countries, along with the African Bank. And they're saying, can you find ways to reallocate? But half of our ODA actually goes to middle income countries. So why are we not asking? How about reallocating the money we already give to middle-income countries for less uh, important things than climate change? So I think there is that issue. And the final thing I would just say is, you know, all of this conversation falls in, is one basic issue in my mind, which is we need to have straightforward and frank conversations about what we can do and what we can't do and what is feasible and what is not feasible. It would be a lot better if we were able to give the money for refugees and cut back on ODA and not pretend that it was ODA, it's better to say to countries, look, we can't do as much ODA as we thought because we have to take care of refugees who have come into our country. But it's another to say, look at our ODA numbers that have gone up yeah. and you have to dig and find that actually it's not real. So I, I do feel that part of the problem we have now is this trust issue which comes from not having a frank uh, and clear dialogue. Very clear. Jean-Michel. Yes, very quickly. Uh, I think we are experiencing uh, quite a negative time for financing uh, Africa and ex external imbalances. Uh, the, uh, we have talked about ODA, and it's correct to say that in the past three years, ODA in <coughs> absolute volumes has declined. Uh, remittances, remittances have declined because of the overall macroeconomic situation in Europe, in Canada, in the US, etc. Uh, China has reduced, has, re has reduced massively its lending for the reasons that we have already mentioned. Uh, and on top of it, uh, Africa has now experienced also increased uh, balance of payment problems, or, I mean commercial deficits problems of all the continent has increased its uh, commercial deficit. So it's, it's, it's a complicated period, and there's a need for uh, a, a big change, if one wants to, to see that changing. Of course, this is a broad assessment about the continent. Country by country, it's different. Not all countries are in the same situation, and obviously the ones that are in the most difficult situations are the ones which are owing most money to China. I mean, it's the big oil and mineral producers, because this is there that the Chinese money concentrated. Actually, uh, uh, Chinese money is not, uh, is not at all distributed even across uh, Africa, but massively concentrated in, on uh, around five, six, six countries. Uh, uh, okay. That of specificity. So we have to address that. And as far as the MDB, but also the bilateral um, uh, ODA is concerned, we have a major uh, issue to solve on both sides, which is the issue of conditionality. This is the one which has been uh, the most contentious. Uh, how is it run? What is it uh, under conditionality? Macro, micro, etc. This is the poison in, in the uh, ODA uh, pill, which is preventing money to flow faster uh, and to reach uh, the basic needs of the, of the countries. And, the, the, and everybody has, has, a, has, a, has a problem there, but the MDDs particularly. OK, fine. The prime minister has uh, the floor, <laughs> please. Yeah. Oh, you, will, you will have the floor immediately after, sir. 
Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Chair. First, I, I think it's, uh, it was important that Aminata uh, <coughs> creates a bit of emotion on the situation of uh, Africa and other emerging markets. But I concur with Jean-Michel. I mean, Africa is in a credit crunch, is in a equity crunch, which, which is, in a sense, uh, worse than what... Uh, happened in 2009, for instance. So it's a real, uh, real crisis. With a sort of pandemic situation where when you have a default of, of a country, it has an effect on countries absolutely in, in, in a deep, deeply different uh, situation. So the fact that Ghana is in default has a paradoxical immediate impact on the Ivory Coast, for instance, mm. uh, and so on and so forth, mm. if, even if the situations are very, very different. But to be constructive, uh, maybe one or two comments. To attract the private sector, we can easily put uh, <coughs> a few uh, tools uh, on the table we know how to insure the risk. We know how to, uh, how to buy and sell the risks. I mean, it's not technically that difficult. Mm. Uh, in the World Bank Group, Bertrand, MIGA can be, it's, it's quite an easy decision, uh, a, a, a sort of m more efficient tool, an essential tool. We know how to develop the guarantee funds. I mean, it's not rocket science. We have a lot of experience. So I think that uh, treating, uh, addressing the risks professionally is really quite simple. Hmm. Second, uh, Bertrand said something very real. Apart from the funding uh, of climate change or social goals in development. I mean, we, we have a problem of being able to absorb what has been collected in terms of funds. And Bertrand is right when he says it's very difficult for the, for the, the emerging countries and the developing countries to be able easily, professionally, to absorb. Take the forestry, for instance. Forestry, you can find business models to invest there, to get the carbon credits, and to have a very positive impact on the planet, okay. But we have not the tax environment. We have not the concession legal uh, system efficient in, in, in every uh, country. If you take the Bassin du Congo, if you take the Congo River system, you have an immense potential and a very, very little number of projects. So even when we have, and if we were able to attract more mm. private uh, finance with the proper risk and insurance environment, we have to uh, support the absorption of those funds. Yeah, but is it the uh, domestic legislation yeah. that you put into question? Or I that? mean, the countries are very in, in equal positions. Mm. I mean, you could say that uh, Gabon is a bit adva more advanced, or Ivory Coast, or but the, uh, South Africa. But we, c we can improve that mm. quite easily. Look at what is done in terms of extractive industries contracts, I mean, support by the World Bank, by the African Development Bank, in order to optimize or normalize that. We can do that. Look at the uh, facility to be financed in, 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 uh, for, for legal professionalism, uh, the, the, the grants by the African Development Bank. We have made huge progress in terms of due diligence and execution and contractual uh, systems uh, for the governments 
through grants. I mean, we can easily technically support, and it's cheap, uh, ways for the environment, the business environment, to progress. Because as of today, it's maybe the, 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 the worst uh, sort of obstacle. When Bertrand says blended finance is very difficult to implement and, and, and make efficient, I mean, it's a daily experience for the private sector mm. to have no efficient and professional interface. But it's, it's cheap and simple. And look at the privatization. It was a huge transfer of asset ownership. Huge, historical in Africa in the late uh, 90s. It has been supported by, for instance, the World Bank Group in terms of uh, professional support, uh, grants and financing for the processes to be efficient. So it's cheap to improve the systems. But the processes are quite important. I mean, the, the, the actual real processes. And on that, we can make uh, fast progress. Clear enough. Thank, Thank you. you very much, because you introduce an element of uh, dynamism in the capacity to get out of the, of the difficulty. Thank you very much, Johnny. Please, you have the floor. It might be the last question, and then we will have a wrap-up with the speakers. Please, sir. Thank you. So, Nicolas Pio, I'm, uh, I'm an investor in private equity, and I've been an investor in energy for 20, 23 years, basically. I, I will expand on Madame Chloe, Prime Minister's uh, question, and just maybe a quick addition to Mr. Mayor's point on Montenegro, because I think it's actually quite important. Not only is it expensive, but what we, what we need to understand is are the, the provisions in the loan agreement granted by the Chinese. It prevents Montenegro to go to another, uh, another um, uh, debt provider, typically Europe, because they are forbidden to actually reimburse that loan because in this case, if they default, there is a provision by which the Chinese can actually grab a piece of land of Montenegro. And in, in that matter, it is the port of, I don't remember if it's Qatar or Brasilia, but I think we need to really understand, for having worked with CIC for quite some time, they know their contracts upside down and there is no clause that is made at random. And so I think the example you're mentioning is super important because it was true of the Gaboron uh, coal plant in, in Botswana. It was true of a number of infrastructures in the world. And I think we need to understand that the, the, this does not come cheap. It may seem cheap on the pricing issue, but it certainly does not come cheap with the structures that you've mentioned. My, the point that I, I would like to expand on, and, and the question, which is maybe a bit provocative, is that I'm wondering in the end if, if our financial system is not fairly obsolete. Because I think the point that Madam Prime Minister is raising is, is capital allocation. You were talking about the, the, the US stock market, which is actually holding pretty well today. Well, the reality is, out of the 3.4 trillion that were added by the MSCI in 2023, 4 trillion comes from, from the Magnificent Seven. So the Amazons, the, the Microsofts, the NVIDIAs, et cetera, which means that all the rest is actually has actually destroyed value on the stock market. So seven stocks added four trillion for a stock market that added 3.4 trillion. And I see that in, in, in my own world, and I think it goes back to my prime minister issue. Today, it's very easy to raise 200 million on a pre-seed round on AI. 200 million for pre-product, pre-revenue, pre-idea. And it's very hard to finance projects in, in, in developing countries. For one reason is because the risk aversion, and I fully agree with Mr. Ahmed, it's not only the public sector, it's the private sector. And the private sector far prefers adding another round of financing of uh, chat GPT or open AI or whatever, rather than <laughs> investing in the real stuff that should, we should be investing in because externalities are not priced in in our, in our financial system. Very good remark, of course. Uh, and uh, uh, to think that there is no risk associated with investing massively in startups is also a fantasy. So we, we are, but 
okay, the, the, the system has to be fixed in many, many respects, that's clear. So it was a very uh, stimulating and interesting uh, exchange of views. Uh, the government of China was not there, so uh, we... <laughs> no, yeah, yeah. But thank you very much for, for all your remarks. It was very, very well done. So uh, can I ask the speakers whether they have a last remark I think we, we had positives and negatives, not only negatives in the exchange of views. And we, we know that we can perhaps, uh, and particularly, I have to say, in the MDB's institution and the, the I would say, public uh, ODA uh, uh, framework, uh, take, taking more risk and uh, leveraging much more uh, private capital. That, that, that is certainly one positive, in, in the, at least coming out of our discussion. But uh, uh, the world remains extremely demanding, that's clear. So I go in the reverse uh, order. Jean-Claude. Well, thank you. Okay. Please. No, I hope that the last, rates last will go down, because it's absolutely uh, obscene to have rates of 10% for Ivory Coast or for Senegal right now. It's obscene. It's impossible. We cannot advise a government to raise euro bonds with 10% interest rates. It's, and we are exporting from the developed countries. Uh, our diseases, COVID, inflation, high interest rates. Well, higher interest rates. <laughs> but but, but these higher interest rates will permit us to get back to price stability, which is good for everybody. So uh, I mentioned that en passant. <laughs> Only. I think all the investors are focusing on so-called ESG performance of companies. I think they should rather look at what they do for developing countries and what they do for Africa, and what to do meaningful things rather than worry about ESG. Yeah, you don't like ESG? No. Really? <laughs> <laughs> My neighbors are very shocked. Uh, Akiri. Well. I'm not an expert in uh, development finance, but just one <coughs> word about Paris Club. Don't forget, there was um, a process called London Club as well, yep. along with uh, Paris Club. Yeah. And, uh, you know, uh, as far as private debt uh, risk scheduling is concerned, uh, Bill Rose always uh, chairman of uh, London Club, and uh, negotiation usually took place in New York, but uh, it's labeled London Club anyway. True. And, <laughs> and uh, along with uh, uh, the public debt uh, risk scheduling under the auspices of uh, Paris Club, uh, Jean-Claude was uh, chairman for a long time ago, uh, three decades ago, I think. Um, London Club approach happened, and uh, usually, uh, you know, at the winks and arm twisting by center banks of uh, uh, the same countries and uh, have them uh, go along with Paris Club uh, offshore debt risk scheduling. That's, that's what happened actually uh, many years ago. So uh, the Chinese concern about the you know, possibility that the public uh, you know, money bailout go into private sector, that didn't happen that way because of the London Club approach. Thank you. It, it was easier at the time because we had banks right. and not, right. Uh, right. I would say, bonds. Yeah. I'll just say one thing in, in uh, defense of uh, the, if you look at the contracts, we actually at CGD, we did a detailed study of looking at the contracts of, uh, that were done for individual loans that were made by Chinese banks. It's true that some of them actually had exactly the kinds of constraints. But I think you see now a learning process over time. So I do feel that the more recent loans that were being made were more aligned with sort of what are the international norms. Because it's a learning process that I think all creditors went through. And, and the other thing I would say, you know, Larry Summers is the chair of uh, CGD. And he made uh, one comment when uh, he said, you know, when we go talk to a, a finance minister from Africa, the Chinese offer him expensive uh, financing, and we offer him a lecture. And at the end of the day, no matter how wise our lecture, it doesn't compete with the financing. So I think we just have to bear in mind as to what is the alternative offer that you're putting on the table. Thank you very much indeed.
Bertrand. Thank you. Uh, I will just uh, refer to, to the summit I mentioned, which happened in Paris in, in June. We can discuss whether it was a success or not, but I think the intuition was right. What we need is to find the terms of a new global financing pact, not just a new Bretton Woods, but a new way to address these issues. And I remember I asked uh, Thomas Buber, he's the CEO of AXA, to, to come on stage. And uh, what, what he said struck me. He said, what we need to bring in the conversation is the world together. Just simply together, because everybody is in his lane. Everybody is saying, I'm, I'm right, I know what I want to do, I know what I need, etc. But we don't talk to each other. We, we don't really work together. I mean, we see that at every level. Mm -hmm. And so I think this, this new pact, which I expect, it might take a number of years, will not be decided by one country, one institution, etc. And it's difficult because, as we've discussed, I mean, there are a lot of centrifugal forces that basically break the together approach. But for me, this is critical. We, we, we need to find ways to work together. Thank you. Yeah. So I basically agree with, uh, uh, with uh, this. Is, it shows that development finance is uh, at, at the core of uh, today's problems. And uh, I agree with Massoud that there is a short-term urgency, but I hope that we won't stop at the short term because we are going to have a succession of short-term urgencies uh, in, in, in the future, as we did in the recent past as well. I would also agree that all well, this is a, co it's a coordination problem, uh, doing it together indeed. And it's not only a public problem. I think the, the, the Paris Club was, was, was extraordinarily successful for the public side, but it took years to, to join forces with the private sector, and I hope that the round table will be able to actually associate all this, uh, and that, will be, that it will be more than a crisis management mechanism, that it can be actually a framework for future debt contracts as well. And uh, what worries me is that we are, we, are, we are still thinking in terms of crisis management, while there is a major pathology of the financial system that needs to be addressed. One word on risk aversion. <clears throat> I think it's built in. And I, I, was, I was struck when I was at AFD that we were spending so much time trying to actually decrease the risk of our investments, while development finance is about risk taking. And there is no alternative because you can't go to your parliament with taxpayers' money and, uh, oh, this is what we did with your money and we took risks. No, we, you have to go to them. We make sure that what we finance is riskless because if not, you won't get any money for future ODA. So it, it's a big contradiction there. One, there, are, there are ways to think about it, uh, to create a set-aside fund to take risks, for example, and it's openly mentioned as that, but it, it, it's, it's something that requires innovation and discussion. One final word on efficiency, and I think I, 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 it may be provocative, but I think the way we define efficiency, including now, doesn't take into account all the discussions about externality climate change, environment, and so on. I'm not sure that trade is efficient in many cases where transport costs are undervalued and that the, the, the price of transport doesn't reflect the social cost, for example. So I would be careful about mentioning efficiency without redefining what we mean by it, because we are in a situation in which we need to understand better when things are efficient, not only from sheer economic current perspective, but including all the climate externalities. Externalities, the, yeah, you are criticizing the price system in which the market economy functions, of course. John. It's, I guess I get the, the penultimate word, the final word will be to the chairman, but let me try to uh, end on a, on a more upbeat note. Uh, the, the consensus is that global growth is going to be sustained. And uh, a year and a half ago, the consensus was we were headed for a recession. And it looks like we've avoided a recession. We are bringing inflation down. And a, not that long ago, there was concern that this process was also going to involve a financial crisis. When the uh, Credit Suisse and uh, the Silicon Valley Bank uh, failed. And it looks like that's not happening. So if that's the case, and we can look forward to 2024 and beyond, sustained growth back to low inflation and greater, in, and greater confidence in the stability of the financial sector despite risks, uh, that's not a, not a bad outcome. And that's probably a positive, out, a positive environment for starting to think constructively about addressing these kind of big problems. Thank you very much indeed, John. 
So uh, I conclude, uh, first of all, in thanking uh, all the speakers, because they stick to what <laughs> had been the rule, concentrate on a few issues. I know that we had no speaker and no discussion on the next financial crisis, which is looming. On the contrary, we could see that we could cope with this uh, start of uh, difficulty in Credit Suisse and in the US uh, Regional Bank. I don't exclude, frankly speaking, that we could have big problems in the non-bank financial intermediation and uh, anything can still happen, particularly if uh, interest rates remain at a high level, obviously, and uh, it is exactly what uh, the central banks are telling us, huh? longer, uh, for longer, enfin, high for longer or higher for longer, uh, even if, in my opinion, they succeeded extremely well in trying to regain control. But, uh, but uh, on the non-bank, which is not, uh, I would say, under the prudentials of the banks, uh, anything can still happen. I am struck and very impressed by the fact that we discussed development, development aid, uh, financing with private uh, funds uh, the development. I have to thank the minister uh, because, um, Madame, you draw our attention on that, and it, it, it had a, an echo which was uh, overwhelming. I mean, we all discussed that. <clears throat> thank you also for uh, all the questionnaires. So, I, I think that if, if I had to conclude with a few words, I would say we are relatively confident at this stage, despite the abominable tensions that we have to cope with, geostrategic tensions. We know that a lot of uh, surprises, unfortunate surprises, can come, and that we have to be prepared for everything. Uh, and we prove that, at least in the banking sector, with what I just mentioned, because the reaction of the authorities was extraordinarily rapid, both in the US and in uh, Europe, in Switzerland. Uh, and, and rapidity of reaction is absolutely of the essence if we have new teasing coming from here and there. And, but, uh, but again, I take the sentiment that uh, we should guard ourselves of being too confident or too optimistic, if I may. That being said, thank you so much for all what uh, you have uh, done in participating actively in this uh, uh, workshop. Thank you very much. Thank you.